Dr. Jennifer Munt is a sleep psychologist at the Northwestern Center for Circadian and Sleep Medicine. She is an assistant professor of neurology and is, the board, and is board certified in behavioral sleep medicine. Dr. Munt is the director of the Behavioral Sleep Medicine Lab um, and serves on the board of directors for the Illinois Sleep Society. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Munt. All right, is my mic on? Sounds like it is. Thank you for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here presenting along with Matt Horsnell, who's one of my patient collaborators. Um, and we're gonna be talking about hypersomnia in adulthood and what is the role of the family and how are families affected. So I would like to start by just um, asking uh, who's here as a supporter or a family member, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand. Great, a lot of you. Okay, it's great to see you here. I want to just also acknowledge a couple of other patient collaborators who have been involved in this project. They weren't able to attend today, um, but Rachel Claire Franklin and Victoria Garza have also been involved in this project. A few abbreviations I want to just mention before getting started. Um, these might be familiar to you, but just in case they're not. So CDH is Central Disorders of Hypersomnolence, so I might be using that abbreviation. And that really just is the, the category of hypersomnia disorders, including Klein-Levin, idiopathic hypersomnia, and narcolepsy. IH is idiopathic hypersomnia. I might be using that just because that's a mouthful to say 50 times in a presentation. And PWH is a person with hypersomnia or people with hypersomnia. Okay. So let me start with just a little bit of background on just what do we know generally about how are families affected by diseases or chronic illness. So there is quite a bit of research on this on just a lot of different um, health conditions. And just to summarize that literature, what it really shows is that the family impact is significant and it's often overlooked. And that impact includes a lot of different things. And you can see these listed here, things like anxiety, depression, sleep issues, um, effects on work and activities and finances. And, and what's interesting is these are a lot of the same impacts that patients themselves experience. So it may be to a different degree, but it's a lot of the same categories, a lot of the same types of impacts that are affecting the family as well. Um, this figure here is from a review paper that looked at all the studies that have been done on how families are affected by a wide variety of diseases and chronic illnesses. Um, you can see this, what this bar graph is showing is just counting up how many publications there have been on these different um, categories. So you can see on the bottom is neurology, which is usually where sleep disorders would fall. And there's been a lot of studies looking at um, other types of neurological disorders. So these authors, when they, they looked at all these studies, and their conclusion was that there's a huge impact on quality of life of family, and that that impact seemed to be pretty similar when we look across different conditions. So let's talk about sleep in particular and hypersomnia disorders. So what do we know about how does CDH affect family? Um, not much, at least in terms of research. You know, we have a lot of anecdotes about this, and I've definitely seen this in uh, working with my own patients. In terms of research, this is the only study that I have seen that's, that really um, looked at the impact on family themselves. So this was a study from a few years ago from Parmar and colleagues, um, and they were surveying parents of adolescents with narcolepsy, so that specific population, only narcolepsy. Um, and what they found was that the biggest negative impact on parents was worry. And worry about a few key things listed here. So parents worried about treatment, they worried about the side effects of treatment, they worried about the stigma that their child faces, they worried about the impact on their family, and they worried about their child's future. So those were the things that showed up in this study as the, the biggest sources of worry for parents. And there hasn't been any research looking at adults um, or family members of adults with hypersomnia. So that was really what we wanted to look at with this study is, you know, we know that these disorders continue into adulthood. How are families affected? So partners and parents and other loved ones, how do they continue to be impacted in adulthood? Um, we also wanted to know more about how are families involved in helping? How do they help to manage the hypersomnia? How do they help their loved one? So I haven't seen any research on this, but again, there's lots of anecdotal evidence, and I want to just share just a few examples of the types of things that I've heard from my patients. Um, I've heard things like 
my wife reminds me to eat. So in this case, it was someone whose stimulant medications suppressed their appetite, so their wife would remind them to eat, and that's obviously really important. Um, I've heard things like, my partner brings me my medication, or my partner puts my medication in my mouth because I have so much sleep inertia, I just can't even take it. So partner playing a really critical role for that type of patient. And then I've heard a lot about social support, things like, my husband's the only one I talk to about it. So families can play a really, really key role in helping to support and helping with managing symptoms. So this study is called the EXPLAIN study, um, and there's two phases to it. So today we're going to be talking about phase one surveys, which is um, nearing completion, and then phase two is going to be interviews. So we're going to be talking about the preliminary results of this phase one, the survey portion. And our goals for this study are to look at a few things. So we want to look at what's the impact of hypersomnia in adulthood on the family members. We want to know more about how are family members involved in helping and our family members getting the support they need. And I do just want to um, have a caveat here that this is an ongoing study. Um, we still are collecting data. We, we have, you know, we're pretty close to our goal number of participants, but um, results might change a little bit before we publish the final results. Um, if you are a supporter and you are interested in completing the survey, you can email us, explain at northwestern.edu, or um, take a picture of the QR code. It'll take you to the study information page, and you're welcome to participate. We are still collecting data. Um, oh, and I should mention the survey is also available in Spanish, so English or Spanish is available. All right, so let me tell you about the participants that we've had so far. Um, so to be in the study, you need to be an adult with a family member who's an adult that has narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so far, we've had 86 people as of when we put these slides together. And we've had a really wide range of ages, which is great. We've had participants ranging from age 23 to 81. Most of our participants have been women, heterosexual, white, and had a bachelor's degree or higher. And it's important to mention that just to think about who does this study represent. You know, this, this is predominantly what our sample has been, so it's just important to keep that in mind when interpreting these results. Okay, uh, we asked participant uh, uh, what their relationship was to the person with hypersomnia, and we've had a really good response from partners and parents. And we've had a handful of siblings participate, um, but it's mostly been partners and parents. And um, I have to say, the response from parents was actually a surprise. I thought that we were mostly gonna get partners and spouses um, participating, but we've had so many parents. Um, and that actually did change the trajectory of the research a little bit for, this, uh, for the interview study. We are now going to be including parent-child pairs as well as partner pairs, just because we've seen that there's, there's a lot um, to look at here, and we want to learn more about that parent-child relationship in adulthood. So thank you to all the parents who've participated. You've had an impact on this research. Um, of the parents that have responded, 62% uh, said that they are currently living with their child with hypersomnia. In terms of diagnosis, so far it's been evenly split. Um, the family member uh, has had either idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy, and it's been 50% in each. You can see with narcolepsy, though, there's different categories, including a few where um, a participant didn't know which type their family member had. But 50% have been idiopathic hypersomnia, which um, I think was also a little bit of a surprise, um, just given that that's not as common. So really, really strong response from idiopathic hypersomnia community. Okay, so we'll start getting into some of the results. Um, part of the survey, one of the questionnaires that we had participants do is this thing called the FROM16, which is the Family Reported Outcomes Measure. And this is a questionnaire that's designed to assess the impact of a family member's condition on your quality of life. And there's a couple of different types of questions. So some of the questions pertain to your emotional well-being, things like, I feel worried because of my family member's condition, I feel sad, caring for my family member is difficult, and then some of the items pertain to your personal and social well-being, things like my family activities are affected, my sleep is affected, my family expenses are increased. So what we found so far, I'm, I'm showing you here um, in dark green are the partner's scores, and then in the, I think it shows up as white, it's supposed to be light green as parents. Um, and looking at the total score and then the score on those two subscales, the emotional and personal and social. So on that total score, which is on the left, um, there's no statistical difference between that. So basically parents and partners have um, equivalent total scores, total um, amount of impact on their quality of life. 
We do see a difference though in looking at the subscale. So on that emotional subscale, parents are, are reporting a higher impact and that is statistically different. Um, we see a, the opposite pattern on the personal and social subscale where partners are reporting a higher impact. Um, that difference is not quite statistically significant, it's very close, so we'll see when we uh, finish data collection if that ends up being um, a significant difference, but as of now, that's what it's trending toward. We wanted to know what types of support family members provide, and so we provided a checklist um, that we developed as a team of, I think it was about 24 different ways that uh, family members might be providing support, and so we just had participants check off which ones they do. So I'm gonna show you um, the, the most frequently endorsed ones. Um, these are all of them that, that were endorsed by at least half of the sample. Um, so you can see the number one is providing emotional support. 84% of participants said that they provide emotional support. A couple of other categories I'm gonna highlight here. Um, hopefully that's showing up. There should, should be some in lighter green. Um, so, so some of these items are really things that are specifically like helping with the symptoms, you know, helping with the medical management, like picking up prescriptions, going to, and that was 65%. 58% um, said they help keep them awake. 54% said they help with cataplexy. Um, and that's of the people that had narcolepsy type 1, 54% um, are helping with that. 50% said they attend medical visits with them. So those are, those are things where it's specifically helping with sort of the symptoms or managing the condition. And then there's another category, which is sort of highlighted in blue now, of just kind of daily tasks that were um, done to help the family member, things like driving them places, 58% said they do that, 56% said they do extra housework, 54% said they do extra cooking, and 53% said they do extra errands. I'm also just gonna show you the few that were least commonly endorsed. I think it's just kind of interesting to see which ones are not commonly done. Um, and those were things like assisting with medication at bedtime, assisting with a second dose of medication during the night, either Xyrem or Zywave, uh, and attending a support group with them. So not many people said that they're doing those things. Okay, we also wanted to know um, actually, Matt, do you want to just jump in? Because So Matt does a lot with support groups, and if you just want to offer some thoughts on, you know, how does this match up with kind of your experience um, in support groups and talking with patients and families? So, um, you know, this is a great question because we have support resources that are available for family members, and the statistics that, that Dr. Munt shared are actually fairly consistent with the participation that I see from the groups. Um, we do have a number of very active parents um, and caregivers that will come to the groups, but they're not in nearly the same number as the, the people with lived experience. And so one of the things that I've seen is how that actually helps both the person with the lived experience, but also that caregiver help to come to an understanding of how can I support this person living with this condition. Um, we've had people come in and, and not really know maybe being a little bit too hard on their family member or maybe the person not um, understanding how their disease is actually impacting their family. And, and I think that it just opens up a place for, for conversation. And we actually have, there's groups that people can attend either, you know, specifically for caregivers. There's a blended groups that are available as well. Um, sometimes the, the caregiver will attend with the person. Other times they'll attend separate groups just so they have their own little safe place. But um, the statistics are remarkably consistent with what we see in the groups themselves. But um, if you guys are considering, I would definitely encourage you to do so just to see what that experience is like for the person that you're caring for. Um, and also to hear just as a, as, a, as a patient, a person with lived experience, what this is like on family members, because it helps me to be a better partner, um, to, to know how my condition is impacting everybody around me, whether it be my kids um, or my partner, or even my parents. So. Thank you. Okay. So another question we wanted to answer was, where do family members get support for themselves? And so again, we had a, a checklist and asked participants to, to uh, just check off places where they get support. Um, the most common were family and friends. Those were 61% and 50%. And then coming in third was hypersomnia organizations. Um, what was interesting is we, we also asked how many people, or whether you have lost relationships because of your family member's hypersomnia, and 26% said that they had. So that's, that's really at odds with the fact that family and friends are the biggest source of support, but yet, a fair number of people have actually lost relationships. Okay, we also wanted to ask where family members are getting information about hypersomnia. 
and we, we included the same categories here, but you can see the order flips around. Um, so hypersomnia organizations was definitely the, the number one here, and, and that included Hypersomnia Foundation and other organizations. So overall, 68% of people um, said that they're getting information from at least one of those types of organizations. 56% said they get information from medical professionals, and 44% said from social media. So those were the most common. Um, breaking down the social media, Facebook was the number one source of information, followed by Instagram, and that was followed by YouTube. We also wanted to know how satisfied are family members with the information and support, because we want to know what we can do better, what's missing, okay, what do we need to change. So we just had participants rate their satisfaction um, from unsatisfied to satisfied. So this is satisfaction with information. 29% um, were just neutral in the middle. And then if we kind of clump um, on either end sort of into categories. So on the left, we have unsatisfied or somewhat unsatisfied. So altogether, that's 36% that are some degree unsatisfied. And then on the right, we have 35% um, are either somewhat satisfied or satisfied. So it's kind of an even split between the unsatisfied, neutral, and satisfied in terms of the information. But we see a different pattern when we look at satisfaction with support. You can see that this is really trending toward the unsatisfied end. And again, if we sort of um, combine these here, you can see that 47% are to some degree unsatisfied with support and only 24% are at least somewhat satisfied with support. So this indicates that there's some more that we can do here to um, provide more support for family members. Um, we asked participants just to write any suggestions and thoughts they had about what could be improved in terms of information and support available to them. This isn't an exhaustive list, but just a, a few things that we heard um, on the survey. So there were, um, Suggestions for more information about a lot of topics, but some of those included things like how to support their family member with hypersomnia, how to navigate the transition to adulthood. Um, participants wanted more information about treatment options and about clinical trials. Um, and in terms of support, we had many people mention that they would like um, support groups for supporters, and in particular for partners. Um, some people commented that the existing support groups seemed to really be geared toward parents, especially parents of smaller children with narcolepsy and that it would be really valuable to have support groups for, uh, for partners as well. Um, and we also had suggestions that health professionals could do a better job of providing lists of resources to both the patient and the family. And those resources could include um, suggestions for places to get information and to get support. Um, so we wanna pause for just a couple minutes and um, have you as just tables, if you could just turn to people in your table and just discuss this for a couple minutes. We would just love to have you discuss what are your thoughts as a table about what do you think could be improved about information and support for family members? We'll give you a minute or two to do that, and then um, we'll ask if anyone would be willing to share with the group. So feel free to turn to your table and discuss for a minute. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that everyone is so talkative first thing in the morning. We weren't sure how this would go, so I'm really glad to hear all the talking. Um, so since there was so much discussion, I would love to hear, we won't be able to hear from every table, but if anyone would like to share just some thoughts of what came up in your group? We would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. And we have a microphone that they can bring to you. Any questions? OK. I'm going to take you because you're closest. Do you mind standing up and saying your name and asking the question? Thank you. Hi, my name's Lauren, and I'm from Chicago. And I'm here to support my daughter. And so um, the questions that I have are, I don't, I don't really have a place where I can go to talk to other parents, and I guess I kind of fall into the adolescent category. She's not an adolescent, but she's still living at home and going to college, and so all of the worries that you put up there are all of my worries. I'm afraid I'm gonna cry. So um, I'm really particularly interested in learning more about medication side effects, and um, I'm sorry, it's just been really difficult. Mm -hmm. So I, I am interested in connecting with other parents of people who have uh, shepherded their kids through this stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, our last slide of the presentation, we, we have another section, um, but our last slide does have a list of some resources about places to get information and support groups. So we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, yeah, we would love to hear any, any suggestions you all have for um, yeah, what, what do we need more of? What types of information, what types of support do we need to create? 
Hi, um, so I'm not a supporter. I am the, the patient person, whatever. Um, I have hypersomnia and there's a doctor at the table and he was asking, what's your story? How did you find out? And when did you start having symptoms? Um, so they thought my story was interesting and wanted me to share it. Um, and it sort of involved my mom in a way because she said when she was pregnant with me that I only moved, kicked, whatever, between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. And then when I was born, I was immediately sleeping through the night. She had to force me to wake up. She's like, I hurt, you need to eat. <laughs> and I would doze off during that and she's constantly waking me up just to get me to eat. And um, you know, my entire life I remember everything was being tired. I remember um, I played Little League one time, and uh, it, it was almost more to the narcolepsy side of symptoms, but it, to me it felt like I had cinder blocks on my feet and I was going through mud trying to run. And I w I'm like, my brain's going, go, 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 run to first base. And I, I was just like slow motion like a cartoon. And of course I get thrown out at first and my dad was one of the coaches and he's like, what were you doing? You look like a pregnant giraffe. And I was like, I don't know, my brain said go, but my body wouldn't. And I, I, to me, I, I think that was one symptom that I remember and just remember sleeping through events and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, he was asking about my delay to diagnosis. I was diagnosed at 27. So as a kid, it's like, oh, you're a kid, you're growing, you need naps. And then, oh, well, you know, as a teenager, you're kind of on the go and you're exhausted and you're growing. And, and in college, I realized I can't do 8 a.m. classes. I had to drop every 8 a.m. class I ever attempted. So I would have classes no earlier than 10, preferably 11. Um, when I got out of classes, I would work until 10 p.m. doing tech support. So I could multitask to stay awake because I had a hard time studying and staying awake. So if I was between phone calls for this ISP I worked for, I could do my homework and study and that helped me to stay awake. But once I got in the real world that started at 8 a.m. every day, I realized I'm late for work, I'm getting in trouble, I'm sleeping for lunch in my car, and I need an answer. So I had a primary care doctor that was terrible. Um, he told me to work out, he told me to eat this, not that. All, a myriad of the things, I ended up going to an allergist and immunologist, and he goes, I think you need a sleep study. When I went to the sleep doctor, he explained the possibilities. When he described IH, I said, that's my life right there, mm -hmm. and he said, I've only diagnosed that like twice in my career. And I was like, you just mm -hmm. described me. And of course, when the study came back, he's like, I'll be damned. <laughs> so, so that's the story. But my mom, um, was she? I guess I would say she was always in tune. Um, if, if I, she knew that if I didn't take the day off of school when I was having a tired day, I would get very sick. I would end up with pneumonia and stuff. So she was always in tune to me and just didn't worry that I was being a bad kid and, and trying to get out of things. Mm -hmm. So. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Got to um, sweat. Um, do we have time for another question? I just want to make a point. I'm Todd Swick, and I spent 42 years as a neurologist and 35 years as a sleep specialist. And the story that you heard is very typical, very long. Uh, elongated time from symptoms to diagnosis. And then even then, the sleep doctor says, oh, I've only seen two in my life. The issue is one of education. The support that we see up on the screen here is not support, it's education. When an individual graduates medical school today, in 2023, they have spent a total of about 1.5 hours in sleep medicine. And if you consider that we spend a third of our lives sleeping, that one and a half hours of education about all the rest of the uh, diseases that can go wrong seems a little bit off. So whatever support that organizations like this and uh, any of the other sleep fields is to urge the medical schools to, and you'll pardon the pun, wake up to the fact that we need more sleep education because we have lots of patients out there who are suffering the consequences of a very limited 
and poor educational system. Thank you. So we'll, um, we do have another section to, that Matt's going to oh, okay. present. So we'll, if we have time after that, um, we'll, we'll have time for more discussion and questions, but I'm going to let Matt take over um, this next section. So, so I think the enthusiasm was so wonderful to see um, because you know that, that's why we're here to talk about how we can kind of improve where we're going and but also understand with where we are. Um, and so some of the questions that um, we ask, open response questions, how has your, your IH narcolepsy affected your relationship with your family member? Um, now I could go down some personal rabbit holes and anecdotes here, but um, I think it's important to kind of look at what, what the research was saying. And what do you wish you had known when your family member was first diagnosed? And what are your biggest concerns or worries about your family member's condition? Um, so I'm just going to read a few of the quotes on the answers. Um, my wife's narcolepsy impacts nearly every part of my life. Work, parenting, social, sex life, etc. I very much admire her strength in dealing with such a difficult illness and know that the impacts on me are much lesser by comparison but is nonetheless a difficult situation for me as her husband. So theme one, you know, accurate diagnose improved the relationship. And I think this is something that, that Dr. Zwick was alluding to as well. If we can decrease that time to diagnosis, raise, we can actually help improve quality of life and relationships as well. So before diagnosis, you, know, you see common themes of tension, resentment, fights, misunderstandings, and I'm sure for those of you in the audience from both sides of the aisle, you can all relate to that. There, there was a lot of friction. After diagnosis, there's almost a complete paradigm shift. There's, there's empathy, there's understanding, there's compassion, and there's better communication. Those were incredibly difficult years for our whole family. It was stressful for our relationship, not understanding what was happening with him. My daughter's diagnosis brought clarity to our relationship. It was helpful to know there really was a reason behind her behavior. So theme two, emotional impact on family. There's no more helpless feeling than watching your child struggle, knowing that there's very little that you can do. I'm angry that I can't change this for her. I'm angry that this disease has stolen so much from us. And I think that last word there, us, I think is important to, to really understand because it is a familial disease. It's impacting everybody who it touches. And, you know, it's, and there, there is anger, and that's a valid feeling, and, and I'm glad to see that it's, it's reflected in the data. She's such a beautiful person, and I want her to be successful in life, but I'm so scared that she will not live up to her potential. And you know, some of these are kind of hard as a person with lived experience to, to read, but it's also so important for me to put myself in the parent's situation. I'm a, I'm a dad of three, so I can relate to this both as a dad. My, my child, fortunately, they're, they're not showing signs of hypersomnolence, but I can relate to how that feels. You, know, you want them to be the best. And so it helps me to see through the eyes of the caregiver as well. Theme three, strain from having a caregiver role. It has made my daughter more dependent on me than she or I would like. It makes it difficult for us to establish the usual boundaries and independence that a 19-year-old should have. I feel like a caregiver. I miss being taken care of. Um, and then finding balance. It's a very fine line about when the person is an adult. You, know, you don't want to nag, pressure. You don't want to hover, don't want to enable, don't want to smother, and you don't want to overstep. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so I'll just summarize what have we learned so far from this explained study. So I mentioned this is all just from the survey. We're gonna be doing interviews to sort of get more in depth and learn more. But I think really what this has shown is that there's this reciprocal connection between family and hypersomnia, right? Family are having an impact on hypersomnia and helping and supporting. The hypersomnia affects the family too, so it goes both ways. Um, we've learned that family members support in a lot of different ways. Their emotional and social health are affected and that the relationship itself is affected. And I think a really important um, thing from this study so far is that family members want more support. That seems to be a, a really kind of an action item from this study. So 
So I'll tell you just briefly about where we're going next. So this phase two is going to be interviews and a few different categories. I mentioned earlier that we, we changed this and are now including parent-child partner pairs based on what we've learned so far. So we're gonna be interviewing pairs, um, par parent-child pairs or partner pairs where at least one of the people has hypersomnia. Um, and also people who are single and have hypersomnia. We really wanna, in the interviews, also get the experience of the people with hypersomnia. So the family members and the person with hypersomnia to get really the perspectives from both sides about you know, what does this look like? This you know, giving and taking support and how the relationship is affected and, and how that evolves over time, um, especially from like childhood into adulthood and with aging. Um, so we'll be starting those interviews this summer. Um, and our final slide here, we just want to share a few resources um, where there, there is information for families and supporters um, and information about support groups. So please take a picture of this and look at these um, links later to find some resources. Um, I think we do have maybe about five minutes, Claire. Yeah, do we have time for a few you. questions? Can you? Yes, absolutely. I have one online. So um, anyone in the room, please raise your hand. Um, we'll get to you. But quick question here, uh, Dr. Munt. How can I better explain IH to my family? Whenever I talk about how hard it is or what I'm struggling with, they just tell me to make myself do things or to eat differently. What would you say to that question? Yeah, that's a hard one. I, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that. Matt, do you want to take that question? That, that is such a challenging question. I think um, for the, the person on, online, I would recommend that, that you see if their fa your family member is willing to actually come and participate in an online support group to connect, to listen to other people with lived experience, perhaps come to a Unite uh, opportunity where they can, they can hear from someone else. Sometimes it's other people's stories that help that person or family member really connect. So it's hard to hear it when it's your child or when it's your partner. So hearing through the words of someone else, I think can make a profound difference in understanding. Uh, hello, my name's David. Uh, just to cap off what you were saying there, uh, when you're having these discussions with people, there's a dynamic that happens where they're really um, putting you in a... They're defining you as someone who doesn't want to make themselves. And I think it's important for all of us, and then we feel guilty mm -hmm. because, oh yes, I must not be trying hard enough. And uh, it's very damaging, it isn't constructive, and I think it's important for those of us with IH to, in that moment, when they say, well, just make yourself or just do it, you know, just try harder, to, to say back to them, uh, you think I don't want to? Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to, that's advocating for yourself, I think, mm -hmm. and, and with the people that are closest to you. It's so hard making them understand but uh, we've got to be powerful and confident in our approach to challenging these subtexts in our discussions about whether or not we're lazy. I have a question here. Good morning. I'm a mom of a son that has definitely has um, narcolepsy too. Um, I'll question some other things of KLS, but more importantly, first, can I tell you, yes, I feel you, I understand how you feel, I will tell you your best support is us, so please get in contact with me. I will also tell all of you, my son was diagnosed at 14, therapy helped me, I know it's different for different people, I don't think I could have survived without therapy with my son. I had to understand how you feel. The hardest part is to know when to push and when to sit back. It is so hard as a parent to know when to say it's okay or to say let's go. And so today is a representation of my son is not here. And for the first time, he was about to come. We were almost there. We had his ticket. He had his suitcase. And in the morning at 6 o'clock, he said, Mom, I can't do it. I can't go. 
And I wanted to say, but you, come on. And I've decided, he's 23, to say, it's okay, stay home. But it's hard. Should I have pushed him? Should he be here? Would it have been better? Thank you. Yes, and I think we have a question over here. So I wanted to share a success story that I had. So my son has Klein-Levin syndrome. My name is Darren, by the way. My son's name is Case. And, and at age of 15 this past year in September, he had what's called an episode, which we didn't know what it was at the time. And we talk about support. Well, he was misdiagnosed, much like I think everybody who has Klein-Levin syndrome has been, been misdiagnosed at some point. And we continued to be relentless, is what I was sharing with the folks at my table, about we knew something else was wrong. It wasn't anxiety. It wasn't just laziness. It wasn't those things. And the success story I'm sharing is that we found this web page for the, um, Klein-Levin syndrome via Facebook. And we were able to connect with probably people in this room on there. And ultimately, my wife was on there and connected with somebody. And she said, oh my goodness, this is exactly what my son has. It's a carbon copy of what you're describing. And we were able to be diagnosed by a doctor in South Alabama. You should check him out. And so fast forward, this was on, I think it was a Wednesday. And literally, we were able to connect with them just by a miracle. And they said, we happen to have an opening tomorrow morning via cancellation. And we live in Nashville. And we packed our bags and drove straight to Alabama. And that next morning at 9 a.m., went down there. And he was diagnosed that day with Klein-Levin syndrome, which is a condition that takes an average of four years to diagnose. And, you know, fortunately, through the connection of the support groups that we have here, able to get a diagnosis quickly and treat him, and he's continuing to get better. So I just want to share that success story, and then you asked about continued things for other support. And I think after doing that, our best thing has been connecting with folks that are in this room and then things we would suggest would be maybe more like Zoom meetings with people in small groups, things like that we could do to periodically connect and not just have it once a year here, but also via Zoom and so on. I think we have time for one more really quick question, and then I would invite everyone who has questions to speak to Dr. Munt or Matt after. One more quick, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I just realized that in our presence we have a uh, somewhat celebrity in Marianne Evans. Um, if you go on YouTube and you look up what not to tell people that have uh, hypersomnia. It is remarkably brilliant and it's so insightful. It's got sarcasm, humor, and it goes on for about five minutes and it's reality in your face. I've been looking for you since 2014 and I finally found you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> 